welcome you all. And that's supposed to be sound mainlandish, where supposedly many of our uh, imported high rises come from. So, anyways, welcome you all to our 244th episode uh, of Human Humane Architecture here on Think Tech Hawaii. And you're about to be our 13,044th viewer. So, thank you for that. Uh, we, uh, you, DeSoto Brown. Hi, DeSoto. Hello, everybody, and hello, Martin, and hello, world. And you're obviously, unfortunately, not in your easy breezy home. No birds, no dogs, but just AC <laughs> uh, in, indoors, yes. which it has yes. to be for your books and such. That's right. And me, uh, equally tragic, not out there on my Waikiki Grand Lanai, because we got all these distractions that we're not supposed to be. So I'm broadcasting from my bathroom in here. So we're both not in the uh, places and spaces that we aspire to and are inspired by. But anyways, so let's bring up the first slide here. And we have to lot, uh, a lot to talk about that first slide. Um, first and foremost, sort of a late entry to what you had uh, been saying, uh, DeSoto, when I was in uh, Porto together with our exotic escapism expert, Susanna, recently, you were sharing uh, this encouragement for our um, uh, Rem Colas to come, supposedly on the corner of Ikoi. And then I always keep forgetting the name of the street, just parallel to Kapilani at the mall, the back side of the mall. What's the Kona. name? Help me out. Kona oh, street. Yeah, that, yeah, that one. So that building to come uh, there, we were uh, telling that uh, Rem was really sort of provoked by the architects in Porto that are pretty good to be even better. And his Casa da Musica, we also have to add, is this uh, you know, music house that he basically designed is pretty much, which you see in the show code with a heart at the top right there. But we forgot to say that uh, Porto prides itself of having two Pritzker Prize, which is the largest, highest recognition in architecture that you can get in the world. Most cities would be lucky if they have one of the architects to have one. They have two. It's Alvaro Ziza and Eduardo Sudomura, the two of them. But even better, there's a bunch of their mentees to carry that on and push it even further. So these are all these people that we have these talents here, too. Um, I'm very close to them. And you're, too, whenever I drag you in, which I do a lot. We have a lot of these emerging talents here. We just got to let them be in charge then we're gonna have a similar situation. And I um, also, we have um, a new friend uh, having just visited us, uh, DeSoto, who is that? Well, that is Philip. Philip is uh, from Germany. He's another German, kooky German, like I like to say people are. And he is a publisher. And he is a publisher of City Guides to Architecture. And we just had a visit from him and he has talked to us about doing a book about architecture of the Hawaiian Islands. And that's something that we are excited about and looking forward to. And it's a huge job. So we won't, um, we don't have too much to say about that yet because we've got a lot of work to do before we figure out how we're gonna do it. Yeah, but also it's pretty much what we're doing here anyways, have been doing for 244 Wednesdays. And so we're going to compile this all and we're going to add more. We're going to have a team to support us with that. And uh, so all of that, yes. And how uh, valuable his books are. They are, he does a lot of books, but the, 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 the ones we're talking about are city guides or regional types, tour guides. And he insists to say they're not just that, but they're an introduction to the building culture in, in these different places and spaces. And so um, I'm going to go, we're on to having discovered investigatively here that according to an article from some while ago, um, uh, we have an imported skyline, which we then make the differentiation. Well, then the question is, is it an, an invasive import or is it a tropical exotic import? Because one is bad, the first and the latter is, is not bad. It's actually good. So that we have to make, but we're finding out that uh, many of the architects of the recent high rises are actually coming from what's considered to be the cradle of high rise architecture in the United States, which is Chicago. And I have the chance to revisit now, um, inspired by our investigations. And I'm stopping by 
my best buddy from my college days, uh, Dan Kubrick, who works for the um, the architect, his boss and friend, who unfortunately passed away not that long ago, was hit on his bicycle by two cars, Helmut Jan. And he has the majority of projects in the book about Chicago that Philip made with an author uh, named Vladimir, first name, um, is predominantly dominating that book. And I learned a lot from that book as what it's supposed to be. And they're really great. Thanks, Philip, for having given me an insight into the just out guide. For example, that our genie gang who blessed us with the Koola that we have been talking excessively about is actually a mentee of guess who, Rem Kolhas. So there we go, there we have a connection. And that's why we uh, encourage Jeannie to basically as mentees should be and mostly are, and she is, to um, excel their mentors and, and, and move on and which she's doing. And our friend Ron, who we miss on the show, hopefully have him uh, back at some point. He was pointing out Jeannie's most recent project in the tempered, uh, Malka of Colorado, which we see at the very top left. It is a hotel. And as it seems to be her thing that she themes things after nature, this one is in the press told, as one can read here, is inspired by aspen trees. We think looking at it more, they mean more than nods on the, on the trunk where the, where the branches used to be as what these windows want to look like. But also in the article, they're talking about that this is a carbon positive hotel achieved through a multitude of means, one that got us curious and excited as a carbon neutral concrete. I have not, you know, been too aware of such a thing. And we've been talking about carbon or carbon friendly concretes where the cement, which is the carbon killer, gets compensated by fly ash or by iron powder and things, but a total carbon neutral concrete we're excited to hear and to embrace and to get here as well. But another thing we want to point out um, is, the, is the middle uh, top uh, show quote here, which is one of our talents speaking of. This is Kelly Keanu, who was doing what to Soto way back? Well, what's happening is that he's using coconut products to create a bunch of different things. And one of them being, uh, as I remember, uh, pegs, wooden pegs that can serve in the, in the place of nails, metal nails, for example. And coconut trees are incredibly productive. And coconut trees actually serve to keep people alive in a bunch of different Pacific locations where coconut trees will grow and almost nothing else will. So to make use of these natural products in lieu of things which require a lot more energy to create and in lieu of things that have to be shipped long distances is something that is very admirable and something that we are looking towards and hoping that we see more of. Yeah. So that being said, again, uh, the kind of more figurative, figurative um, alluding to uh, a raw model in the plant life as an aspen tree Maybe next time one could also do it literally in building it out of solid timber, which is something that's really picking up uh, on the mainland a lot. Uh, Colorado has a lot of forest, has a lot of trees. So it used to be cross laminated timber. And now as Kelly picked up on from my encouragement, using more cross nails, using wooden dowels, uh, the industry is evolving in that sector could actually get even more closer to a literally and figuratively alluding to uh, some natural phenomenon project. So what we're saying is, yes, uh, Jeannie, you're going the right direction. And uh, you know, with this one, more than the Kula that we got blessed by her. So the next step, we would encourage you to go that way because that's what the emerging generation is doing as we can see at the very uh, bottom left. And what is that excitingly? Oh, that looks like a shrouded building to me, and or it looks like a giant tree that's enveloping a building. What it's what it's doing, and uh, I, you encourage your emerging generation students to think outside the box and to do a variety of things with a variety of different materials, so that people are living in different conditions and. There are a whole bunch of ramifications to this, which we don't have time to discuss right now. 
But this is the type of thing that I've seen with people that you encourage, the young students that you encourage to not just do a concrete box with glass, but to open it up, to use water, to use other types of materials, uh, this, this uh, steel or basalt fibered netting, for example, is something else, it's something that we're gonna be potentially seeing. Anyway, again, it's just being different and thinking differently. Yeah, and it's going back to the vernacular of the locally available materials, another sort of addition to, to having talking in the past and actually having to do shows about our findings in Porto um, uh, is picking up again on Sudan Mora. So one of the two Pritzker Prize pr winners as at the bottom right, we had already briefly talked about his Borgo Towers and his Borgo Towers that we then also took the emerging or Hawaiian emerging generation there via Zoom when we were at Porto, as you can see in the middle on the right column. Uh, this is a building that is clad with the original local material, which is granite. Granite is the geological foundation that basalt is ours. And that's why you're referring to when you had been on the review last week. Yes, we're, uh, we're finding that you can make basalt into cables and cords and span them, create tensile systems out of a local material, as Sodomora has been doing in Porto with granite. He basically used it for a rain screen, which you need there because it's very rainy. And Suzanne tells us that she's never been that cold as in the winters in Portugal as a sweet 16, although it doesn't get sub-zero, but it just stays above and it's really damp and cold. And we even know this here from our microclimate zone up there in the mountains where people are saying, wait a minute, I'm not down in Waikiki where you are, where it hardly ever rains or out in the Eva Plains where it's like desert. I am getting cold at certain conditions when it's, you know, not that the temperature is not that high and it gets moist, then you get that situation. But again, there, there is this movement, obviously, you know, internationally and inter interculturally to revisit sort of, um, you know, and in, in, in re, re, yeah, revisit indigenous practices, which as you know, more than anyone else, and Philip has also toured your museum after we met, and that's the best documentation of these indigenous practices, how people have been built with what's there from scratch, so to speak, right? No Amazon button pushing possible at that time, right? And the young, young generation is um, very, 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 very excitingly rediscovering that, which we're happy to be around them. And so um, the last couple of shows, rightly so, as encouraged by Jay and you know everyone else, how can you not think about Again, the circumstances that the emerging generations is operating under. When I was in school some 30 years ago in the early 90s, which we'll get to at the next slide, next, um, not now, but that was the last time of like fossil formalism, where what's the next thing new one know, new one know. We were pretty much okay. I mean, there were issues here and there, but ever since there's climate change, there was a there is still a global pandemic. I was about to say there was, it's still there. And uh, you know, on top of that, we have uncivility at its worst ever since my culture did that to the world. We have that now Putin doing to the world. And so um, it, it is intense. And we've been pointing out that first and foremost, it's for the people in the Ukraine, they're losing their third skins, which now it's luckily summer, Suzanne reports by doing um, farming in her town with a friend of ours who's 80 year young and he's the last a regional farmer in the community. And she was saying it, it basically went from somewhere in the chilly 60s, somewhere lower 60s to mid 80s all of a sudden. So we're out of the freezing, which is great for the people having lost their thermal envelope, but the summer only lasts so short and then we're gonna have that back. And so um, we have been therefore all the past shows starting off with these terrible images of facades blown off buildings, buildings being totally gone. So they're going down while here they're going up. This time we wanted to take a little bit more encouraging angle to Soda, right? Because uh, Philip was also reaching out to us um, because he actually, before he is teaching currently as a visiting professor at Brown University on the East Coast, but before that he was teaching in the Ukraine. And he reached out to me and he said, Martin, are you interested with a couple of other schools to basically do a competition 
do student projects in, in rebuilding that. And when talking about that before the show, you got really excited about it. Share that a little bit. Yeah, and one of the things that uh, we're seeing, the, we're seeing mass destruction of the country of Ukraine. And at some point, the war is going to be over. At some point, it's going to have to reconstruct. And as you keep saying, in the 1940s, much of Europe underwent the same terrible destruction. I'm saying that I would love to see, in the case of Ukraine, an international effort to not only rebuild and restore, but to do it better, as we keep saying, to use new materials, new techniques, and whatever, and also to see it as a cooperative, international, not necessarily competition, but group of people who get together to assist Ukraine architects themselves. I mean, and it shouldn't be that outsiders come in and dictate. It shouldn't be that outside people come in and say, here's how you're going to rebuild. We're going to make you rebuild your country. No, it's assist and it's to cooperate. And it's the antithesis of a war. It would be the absolute opposite of destruction. It would be the opposite of conquering. There would be a cooperative international adventure and venture. And I would love to see that as something that replaces the destruction and the death and the terror that's going on in that country right now. So let's look forward to that. Let's, let's keep our hopes up that that is something that's going to happen and that when it occurs, we're going to see innovative buildings. We're going to see new things that are being done that aren't just like everything else. But Ukraine could be a test case to show off all of these things in a more hopeful, better time in what we hope is the very near future. Yeah, and that being said, again, preparing for being in Chicago soon brings back the memories of when I was there last time about a decade ago, where I took the emerging generation to one of the leading architectural firms in, in the U.S., which is Skip Rowings Merrill, that we have talked about. As sufficiently as well, because they blessed us with two buildings on our islands as well, one uh, being the Mauna Kea Beach Hotel, which is a fine example of tropical modernism. And then when my university was uh, still smarter, they followed best practices and commissioned SOM to do the engineering school, which is a very nice tropical exotic building as well. And so uh, they have been doing also talking high rise, one of the beacons for me for bioclimatic high rise is the Commerce Bank Tower in Jeddah. That was in the mid eighties. And that's actually besides that Bill Chapman rightly so called our friend Ron Lindgren, the best postmodern architect. I think he rightly so he shares that recognition or that award with SOM for that building because in the eighties otherwise was the epitome of postmodernism and prestige and the fake and the pretending. Uh, but these are real, authentic, en en engaging buildings with, with the people and the planet. And it was basically analyzing you know, uh, indigenous practices of courtyards, keeping the sun out in the heat, and incorporating that and blending that into the all-American typology of a high-rise. So it was not as what you're saying, we're coming there as the imperialist. We're coming there as the diplomats in the best sense and trying to blend and merge our cultures. Unfortunately, when uh, I, I was there with the students last time, um, they had um, a project um, at that point uh, fresh on the table that was what then became talking the desert, the Arab desert, the Burj Khalifa, which it then was finally named after and which prides itself, I think, still to be the tallest tower in the world. And when they were went, walked us through the excessive construction documents, at one point we said, well, what's the concept of the building? And they said, uh, desert flower. And we, we were still giving, you know, keeping up the hope and giving it the benefit of doubt. And we say, oh, it functions like, like a desert flower, like it can you know, retain its uh, hydration in a hostile climate. And they're like, no, it just looks like a flower and plant. We're like, oh my God. This firm that many, including me, believe basically had brought a Miesian idea and Mies, we will get to him in a little bit, um, um, you know, has, you know, built only a couple of handfuls of buildings. They basically mass popularized the Miesian idea so that firm sank basically that low. I had one more time actually with my desert, with my uh, mainland desert, Arizona students to go there some few years after. 
and I was relieved there was another cookie, as you call them, rightly so, German guy, and walked us through the firm. And when I asked him why he works for the firm, he named just that project of the um, of the Jedi Tower as his favorites and as an inspiration and motivation to go to that firm and encourage them to go back to their origin, which there are signs they're doing that. And there's actually a project in Chicago that 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 uh, Ulf Meyer reported on, who is um, uh, Philip's first author of one of the first guides was Tokyo. And, um, and Ulf just reported on that on being sort of a revisiting of the Hancock building in blend with, I think, the Manetta building. So it's like out of solid brick and, and steel. And so it's, they're kind of revisiting their roots, which is really, which is really good to see. So again, not as imperialists coming in as saying we're Americans, we rule the world. That was then and now is now. Today being sort of equal collaborators. And again, as um, you pointed out again, if we wouldn't have screwed up so badly and doing just what Putin is doing right now back then under Hitler, uh, there's always hard to say under these circumstances, but say it anyways, there's always a good thing about even the worst. You got Mies van der Rohe because of that. And while he had built very little in Germany, he really came to full fruition in the United States, including in academia. He built the whole campus of IIT and Crown Hall as the architecture school, but also in town. So we can say this is Lakeshore Drive Apartments are is the ancestral raw model for all the glass high rises we're getting here now. However, Chicago has a significantly different uh, climate, and I will never forget that image that I saw somewhere and have to find it again. If you would be the Chicagoan historian, you would have it in your in your in yeah. your in your in your archive. It's where the residents were uh, scratching eyes like you do on your car window, but from the inside in Lakeshore Drive apartment towers, because at that time talking technology wasn't as developed as this idea. So only what he had was single pane glass. And when it gets uh, not just brutally cold, the Arctic pushes down temperature, but also you get this wind uh, lake, uh, lake effect snow stuff there. And then you try to keep it relatively comfortable inside. You get the dew point where, where your beer bottle gets it when you get it out of your refrigerating compartment, right? Right on the glass. So these circumstances we don't have, but positively speaking in winter time, that sun can also heat you, which we don't have a condition here. So of course, again, what's been done currently to uncritically import, to say the least, um, uh, um, you know, these, these towers, is is not a smart idea. You have to go through that process of tropicizing your your mindset. The the good the good encouraging note that we want to use here is the picture at the bottom left, because um, uh, Ukrainians it shows that Ukrainians don't even need us principally as far as being skilled. This is from there is a competition uh, for fictional high rises they call Evolo. And just yesterday, the winners of this year were announced, and they're fantastic, visionary, speculative projects that should all be built. Last year, these guys here were the winners, and they're credited up there. And there's a, there are young, upcoming uh, architectural firm from the Ukraine. So they, again, but when I look at that picture, we looked at that picture, which is obviously in New York. Um, it's kind of ironic because, as you said before, this looks like it would belong to Hawaii and should be in Hawaii, while not in when that picture, obviously, there's leaf on the trees. So this is a summer picture of New York City, but we know these, and you've lived there, not that far away from that in your childhood, which we're revisiting frequently with heavy coat on. So you know what that snow is. So that tower might actually be, and if you read the description of the project, we provide you the link at the bottom. It, it is again, it is just like as we're recommending for Genie to do next. Um, it is a both uh, basically um, literally and figuratively inspired by nature system. So it's less, I guess, mimicking nature as biomimicry, but basically being more biophilia, trying to understand uh, the, the principles of nature uh, better and, and, and apply them to architecture. So yeah, we we can't you know thank um, basically um, 
um, you know, Philip enough to have this idea. We're excited to join them in these efforts of um, an international and intercultural kind of brainstorming for uh, rebuilding. And we pointed out, you know, other architects like Lord Foster, um, who we pointed out to as uh, for whom that SOM, this is how intercultural things work. He's a Brit, right? But he got inspired by Americans, SOM, by that power in, in Jeddah that I was talking about for his commerce bank. And there you go. You, you inspire each other from different continents, from different generations. And that's basically how, how it works in this case. And yes, uh, we just have one of our mentees here watching us, Kim and Pia. Hi, good to see you again. And just so that you've been at their review. So it's all coming full circle and that's the way it's supposed to be. So we probably end on that note only on one slide today, but there was much to talk about uh, as to share encouragement. And, and um, until then, our hopes and prayers are for the ones who are still hanging in there for the time being. And as you said, hopefully that tragic um, you know, crime to humanity is going to stop soon and we can start the rehumanizing phase there too. Yeah. Okay, so that's it for today. We're going to continue with looking into this area here of high rise development around the Alamoana Mall. Uh, next week, I am reporting from Chicago. You're reporting from Honolulu. Good teamwork. And until then, Please all stay increasingly human and humane. Bye-bye. Yep. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.